Good morning, and welcome to Hillsdale United Methodist Church. My name is Jerry Webb. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning, and uh, we are uh, in the midst of um, the youth mission trip. Matter of fact, I think they left about 30 minutes ago if they were able to leave on time, and they're headed to Atlanta as we speak for their mission trip this week, and of course that takes Noah away from us. And we have a very special guest artist who you've seen and heard before. Ethan Zondori is here to share his giftedness with us as we worship this morning and uh, welcome the presence of the living God into our uh, midst of worship. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to remain in your seats as Ethan shares his gift with us this morning and you can um, sit and relax and embrace his wonderful gift of of worship music for us as, as we listen and as we are inspired and led through his music. So Ethan, welcome. We're glad you're here and we look forward to, to how you bring us and prompt us in the presence of, of God. Would you pray with me before we begin? God, we are grateful for the church. We are grateful for the opportunity that we have this day to come into your presence, to hear the wonderful gift of Ethan's music as he shares from his heart all that it means to him to be a Christ follower. And Lord, we pray that as we come together, that we too are blessed by your Holy Spirit in this gathering time. Be with us as the church of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Thank you, Ethan. Crown you, full face down, and 
atonement for us through the Son overcame all the power of death and we praise for the stripes for the wounds for the beating you pour for the tears and the blood that was willingly poured for the merciful wonderful majesty your love To know the one my soul and heart adores. I have one single aim. I am to bring you holy praise. To shower all my love here at your feet. 
Jesus, you are all I want or need. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, I found in you. To know the one my soul and heart adores. I have a single aim to bring you holy praise, to shower all my love here at your feet. But Jesus, you are all I want to Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight are found in you. But Jesus, you are all I want or need. And Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight are found in you. Found in you, it's found in you. Oh, it's found in you. Jesus, you are all I want to need. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight are found in you. But Jesus, you are all I want to need. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight. Found in you. Oh 
Would you stand and greet your neighbor as we pass the peace of Christ Jesus? And we welcome the children to come forward for children's time. Good morning, good morning. How is everybody? Good. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, we were a little quiet this morning, a little quiet. So I got the cutest video of my granddaughter laughing this weekend. Have you ever heard a baby laugh before? Have you? We have a, we have a little video. It's not her, but it's another baby laughing. I want you to take a look at it. Oh my goodness, see, you can't watch it without smiling, right? Wasn't that so cute? You just hear that baby laughing and you can't help but laugh. I heard a lot of our friends in the audience laughing. It's like laughter is contagious. Do you know what that word means? What is something if it's contagious? It spreads, yeah, it spreads from one person to the other. What's something else that's contagious? What about your smile? People smile at you, do you just wanna smile back? Yeah, you do, right? What about being kind to someone? That's contagious. If I do something kind for you, you might do something kind for someone else. They'll do something kind for someone else. It spreads just like that. And what about God's love? Yes, that's contagious also. And we have a chance to spread God's love next week. We are seven days away from the funnest week of the summer. What are we going to have? What are we doing next week? Nobody knows? Vacation Bible School. That's right. That's right. Vacation Bible School. I hope you're signed up. It starts next Sunday, the 21st through the 25th. So far, we have 70 kids signed up. 70 kids. Well, I hope you do sign up. If you haven't signed up already, now's your chance. We want to get everybody registered. And I am in need of some more volunteers. So we have a lot. We are blessed with a lot of youth that want to serve and help, which we love. We want them to help. But I need some more adults. I need some adult volunteers to be crew leaders. So if you feel led to do that, please register this week. Let me know that you're willing to help because, well, I'll miss you if you can't come. That's all right. Um, but we still need helpers. So if you could think about that, pray about it. We need some adult crew leaders. All right. Now we are finishing up all the preparations this week for VBS. So I'm asking if you could also pray for us, pray for the volunteers, and pray for the children that are going to be attending because it is a lot of fun and we get to teach them all about Jesus and spread the love. All right. Let's say a prayer. We'll head over to Power Hour. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for our church family. I just thank you for these children. I ask that you're with us this week, Lord, as we prepare and just help the focus to be on you as we are running around getting ready. I ask also that you send us some families, Lord, that need to learn about you and your love and some volunteers that would like to lead and teach our children. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, children. Have a wonderful time this morning in Power Hour. <clears throat> Remember, God loves you and we love you. Well, um, just wanted to share a couple thoughts with you this morning. I, certainly, Christy gave you our announcements. We need help with Vacation Bible School. And if you're able, uh, please consider doing that. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us, even if you can only give us a night or two to come up. Um, with having 70 uh, kids pre-registered, we'll have well over 100 children each night. And it's, 
it's a joy to be among those kids and uh, to see uh, their eyes just light up and uh, more importantly to give us an opportunity as Christ followers to to share Christ's love with them so it is a a great opportunity for us and we hope you'll come and be a part of that next week we can uh, take some time this morning to pray for those children and to pray for those volunteers uh, that will be um, leading us through Bible school. I also wanted you to be in prayer for uh, Noah and the youth who are on their way uh, this morning to Atlanta. Uh, they're going to Atlanta for their mission trip this week. 26 kids and four adults are already loaded up and hopefully on their way. Uh, that was their plan anyway. And so we need to be praying for them and uh, praying for their opportunities as well that, that uh, God will work through them. God, God is already working through them, but that God will work through them to show the love of Christ uh, with everyone they meet this coming week and that there, there will be experiences in their life uh, that they can draw closer to each other as youth members and also draw closer to the, to the communities around them that they serve in and through Jesus. And then finally, I wanted to lift up to you, we had uh, such devastating news yesterday as the assassination attempt on former President Trump. Uh, we need to be praying as Christian people for our witness and for our example to, to be able to shine through all of the the hate and all of the rhetoric and all of the division that exists uh, within our culture and within our communities. Uh, it is our role, it is our responsibility as Christ followers uh, to show the world that we don't live by hate and that we don't live by hurting one another or killing, but that um, we live by love uh, the scriptures tell us, and what we'll focus on today as part of this message about being simply Christian is that our world around us will know us because of the love of Christ that exists in us and that shines through us uh, in all the ways that we touch the world and touch our communities. So I would like for us to, to add that prayer to our prayer list today as we consider um, joining our hearts together as we go to the Lord in prayer. Will you join me now as we pray? Father God, we are so grateful for all that you've given us, for all the ways that you have renewed us in our life, in our spirit, in the essence of who we are, we thank you, Lord, for the way that you revealed yourself to us through Christ and how we had that opportunity to be reborn through his love. Now as we seek to be faithful in response to his grace and love, help us, Lord, to be a shining example of what it means to be in Christ and to be ones who live into the love of Christ for those around us as we consider the children that we'll meet next weekend and next week as we love those children into a relationship with Jesus. Lord, work through us. May they see something different in your community gathered here and may they have a heart that burns for that desire and for that connection. Lord, may our youth as they go to Atlanta this week to do your work and to be an example of your love, may they meet people whose lives will be transformed by their witness, who will say, I don't know what it is about these kids, but they're so different and I want to be like that. I want to know what they have. Lord, may their witness, may their love do mighty works this week we pray for their protection. We pray for their safety. We pray, Lord, for their lives to be renewed and blessed in the midst of this wonderful outreach opportunity. We also, Lord, pray for 
the community around us, the culture around us, the worldview that exists even within our own country, how it seems to be so much hate and so much um, evil that just is brought out in, in speeches and rhetoric and, and the polarization of ideologies. Lord, may we, as your people, give the voice to the love of Christ and that voice be our only voice. May they know us because of Christ who lives in us and shines through us. We pray, Lord, that we will be people we will be people who are faithful to the task that you have given us to talk about Jesus and to spend our lives bearing witness to Jesus. That's who we are and that's who we pray that you will be through us as we live our lives in faithful obedience to your grace, your mercy, and your love. Lord, we pray all of these prayers today as part of our witness, as part of our encouragement for one another. May we never lose hope. May we never forget the amazing thing that you have done through each of us, through that grace and through that mercy. And may we pass it on to everyone we meet. We pray this prayer today in the name of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. If our ushers will come forward, we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Just like heaven When you walk into the room There's not a thing that's hidden When every eye is on you I can't get enough of your presence It's the perfect point of view Isn't it just like Just like Just like heaven sound like heaven when you're singing over me and there's not a voice more constant the melodies they never cease so here I will stand in your presence in my true identity doesn't it sound like sounds like just like heaven
Well, good morning. Um, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Simply Christian. And we've, we've been on this series for a good while, uh, looking at what it means to um, embrace and believe in the foundational beliefs of, of being a Christ follower, what that looks like, uh, how we should live our lives as Christian people. And so um, we spent a good bit of time talking about the human condition, and looking at um, the Old Testament, what the Old Testament had to say about the Christian faith and what was prophes prophesied through the prophets uh, and ultimately fulfilled in the New Testament. Um, last week, uh, after we kind of left the Old Testament, uh, I shared with you a message about Jesus uh, announcing the coming of a new kingdom and what uh, his life and his witness meant to that ushering in of that new kingdom. You know, uh, that 
that was a struggle with the Hebrew people hearing um, from Jesus and uh, having a certain expectation of what that revelation of a Messiah would look like and, and uh, being excited about that revelation and then ultimately um, it not being exactly the kind of revelation uh, that they expected. Matthew wrote his gospel to uh, Jewish people and he did this with an understanding that um, this was not what most of the Hebrew people thought would happen with the Messiah. And so I want to share with you today really the heart of the matter of the Christian faith. The heart of the matter of the Christian faith is Jesus. And Jesus being our rescue and renewal of life. And so that is, that is it. That, that is the center of our faith expression. But I want to bring us into that uh, understanding, that foundational belief of, of Jesus rescuing us and renewing our lives uh, through the lens of Matthew's gospel where he's trying to help the Israelites understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So if you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me to the 11th chapter of Matthew. We're going to be reading uh, verses 25 through 30 of this particular section. Now there's two movements that take place. Uh, the first paragraph that I'm going to be reading is um, a prayer that Jesus is praying to his Father God in heaven. And he's, he's engaging in this in this prayerful conversation with, with God, his Father. And then immediately in the second paragraph, it turns to a different audience. Jesus turns away from that prayer with, with the Father, and he begins to speak to us with a very specific invitation in light of what he just prayed. So follow along with me. Matthew 11, again, Matthew is the gospel writer who is writing very specifically to the Hebrew people for their understanding. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says this, At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, then I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together this day be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We talk as Christian people about the revelation of God. It's our final book within our New Testament. The revelation. What has God revealed to us human beings? And Jesus spends this time in the 11th chapter of Matthew talking about this unusual revelation and how he, in his nature and in his relationship with the Father, is revealed. It's interesting that he says this, I thank you, Father in heaven, uh, that you have revealed this 
to the pure in heart, the infants, those who would embrace, and you've hidden it from the wise and the intelligent. I think Jesus is making a comment there in this whole dynamic of, of the struggle that human beings um, had, uh, specifically the struggle the Hebrew people had with Jesus and his identity and who he was and, and how that was being revealed. We as human beings struggle with revelations. We, we go throughout the passage of life often uh, coming to a new realization of the things that have been revealed to us over the course of our short time on this earth. When I was a young man um, going to college, uh, I realized that God was speaking to me and saying to me that he wanted me to be a pastor. And this was in 1977 and 1978 when these words were really um, heavy on my heart and, and this realization was very, very clear. Um, I had accepted Christ when I was 12 years old, a few years earlier than that. But when I was a freshman and sophomore in college, I knew. I knew that it was God's calling uh, for me to be your pastor and to, to be a Christian pastor. But I had some influences that were working on me uh, in a different sort of way. First, my brother, who's two years older than me, uh, made the decision to be a pastor. And when you have family systems uh, go a certain way, um, family systems mess with you. And so I viewed um, this calling uh, that my brother Chip had as his calling. And why would I dare um, um, try to take away from what God was doing in his life by saying, I want to do what you're doing? And so uh, that worked on me. And, and my dad also worked on me because my dad was, uh, um, he, he lived through the Depression uh, he wanted all of his uh, boys to make as much money as they possibly could. He knew that Chip was not going to make a whole lot of money as a pastor, and so he was putting a lot of pressure on me. You're going to have to carry the load, Jerry. Go out and make as much money as you can. And so th those, those dynamics uh, played an important part of my life and my decision. And so for the first 18 years of my career, I decided to go in into business and to work in, in business and make as much money as I possibly could. And I did a pretty good job of it. And early in my life, I, I became a part of a, of a company, a small company based out of Elkhart, Indiana, and we sold windows and doors all over the country. So um, I became a manager and quickly found myself as a young man flying from this area up to Chicago uh, over to Elkhart, Indiana on numerous occasions for, for business. I'll never forget one particular flight. And I honestly, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe I can say it uh, pretty, pretty much as a fact. It was my first flight uh, from the southeast to Chicago. Uh, it was one of those flights that you take real late at night uh, to save money. We were a small company. We didn't spend money extravagantly, even with business. And so I was flying into Chicago's O'Hare late at night. And as a young man, uh, I enjoyed having a window seat in the airplane because I liked to see what was going on. It was especially beautiful that night. It was one of those clear nights where you could see for miles and miles and I could see outside of my plane window, Eastern Airlines, we were on a whisper jet. Some of you don't even know who Eastern Airlines is. But we were on a whisper jet and we were just making our way beautifully into Chicago. And the first thing that I noticed was for what seemed like miles and miles and miles were these patterns of beautiful amber residential nightlights that you could see from the plane as we were making our approach. And, and they were just beautifully designed 
all around this magnificent city. I guess this is where people lived and made their way into the city. And I just remember thinking to myself, God, this is just beautiful. You have given human beings such an incredible gift to design and create and to build. And then as we got closer to Chicago, I saw the skyline, the night skyline of Chicago lit up. And it's, it's right on one of the beautiful Great Lakes. And so you see this darkness behind and this well-defined uh, Chicago skyscrape lit up at night. And, and again, it was such a, a revealing of, of our abilities as human beings and such beauty uh, in the quietness of this peaceful um, landing what I thought was going to be a peaceful landing. But it wasn't at all. Something else was revealed to me that night. We get real close to the runway, and, you know, we're all expecting the little jar and the jolt of the wheels hitting the pavement and, and the plane slowing down very rapidly. But instead of that happening, we take back off. We get really, really close. I'm looking out the window at the, at the runway, and all of a sudden, we're going back up in the sky. And within a few minutes, the pilot comes on and said, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we realized at the last minute something wasn't exactly right. We had some lights flashing in the cockpit, and we decided to um, not land and take some precautions. And as that conversation unfolded, what we all discovered was that as the landing gear comes down, there's two sets at the rear of the plane. One engages properly and the other doesn't. It comes out halfway. And so very fortunately for us, uh, the pilot observed the warning signs and he said, we, we have a few things that we're going to try to get that wheel to come down and lock in place. What was kind of funny is after he said that, the co-pilot comes out of the front of the airplane and they begin to rip up carpet in the aisleway. And they begin to take some of the flooring off of the floor of the highway. They told us what they were doing. They were trying to reach through or climb through and get to a point where they could manually crank down this other wheel set that wasn't properly engaged. That didn't work. That didn't work. So the next thing they said was, we're going to go fly over the Great Lakes for uh, a half an hour or so and dispense of all the fuel we possibly can. Because if we have to make an emergency landing, well, we all got the image. And so this beautiful revelation of the skyline of Chicago and the, 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 the lights and the magnificent structures all of a sudden became everyone's greatest nightmare. And us flying over the Great Lakes for that 30 to 45 minutes to get rid of fuel, boy, the anxiety, the fear, the visualization of what the revelation might be for all of us, people began to pray. People began to pray out loud the Lord's Prayer. People began to cry. The pilot came back on and he said, uh, we're going to try uh, a, a maneuver and if this works, uh, everything's going to be good. If it doesn't work, then we will have to retract the good landing gear that is in place and make a belly landing on the runway with foam and uh, but we're going to get you to Chicago. Well, we, just, we, we were not too sure. But he said, this is the maneuver we're going to try. We want you to brace for impact. We're going we're gonna to go down uh, to the runway again, and we're going to uh, adjust the airplane in such a way that we hit really hard on the wheel that is locked in place in hopes that the other landing gear will jar into place. And if it does, uh, we will land. We, we will take back off after we bump, but then we'll land appropriately. 
And the pilot said this to us. If you pray, now's the time to pray. So our revelation, this revealing of this time in, in our life became quite different. I will make the story short. Short. We, we did the bump. As we bumped, uh, I was looking out the window. I wasn't supposed to be. We were supposed to have our head, you know, down at our knees. But I was looking out the window, and what I recognized as we hit hard and took back off was for every stretch of that runway, there were emergency fire engines, ambulances, first responders lined up on both sides and lights flashing uh, from, the, from the runway to the belly of the plane. I guess during the night they were trying to visually give the pilot uh, the okay whether the landing gear had engaged. And so we did that. Uh, we bumped. We took back off. It worked. It did um, jar the landing gear back in place and we came around and made a good landing and we began to celebrate and uh, a lot of alcohol was dispensed and uh, a lot of cheers and applauding took place. It wasn't the kind of revelation that I was expecting especially as I was coming into that beautiful city and was admiring the surroundings. All of a sudden, what I had just been thanking God for, the, the beauty of that city, uh, became a nightmare. And it became worrisome. And I began to think of my, to myself as a young man, who I said to you, I had already felt God's call. Is this it, Lord? Is this... Is this what I have given up? I, I decided to do this business venture instead of doing what I knew you were calling me to do. You know, sometimes as human beings, we do that. Sometimes we get certain perspectives in our lives and, and, and we, we kind of go through life with, with these changing revelations, this changing reveal. I... I imagine the Hebrew people, the Israelites, in that moment of Jesus revealing and speaking this revelation of himself, felt their world crash in. Their expectations of a Messiah, by the way, the, the Hebrew people, is quite different than what happened with Jesus. They were expecting Jesus to be the anointed one who would bring about a national reversal, who would come riding in on a gallant steed, not with a crown of thorns, but with a kingly crown and would draw out his magnificent sword and would put the enemy in their place and establish the kingdom, the nation. Of Israel. That was the revelation that the Hebrew people were expecting. So I don't think there's any surprise in what Matthew felt like was important for the Hebrew people to hear Jesus pray. Those of us in, in the scholarly realm of, of looking at Scripture and trying to to dissect everything that's said. One of the questions that we often ask through the reading of the Gospels is, did Jesus realize who he was? While he was here, did Jesus understand the revelation of himself? Did he understand himself to be God, to be divine? I don't think you can read Matthew eleven twenty five without saying, yes, yes, he understood. This conversation that takes place in this prayerful way between Jesus and God, I thank you, Father in heaven. I thank you 
that you have revealed our relationship to those who are the most innocent. And you've hidden it from the wise and intelligent. Jesus had to be getting some kickback from the chief priest, from the, from the clergy who were saying, oh no, this isn't what it's going to look like and you're not who you say you are. So this affirmation of Jesus' understanding with his father and he says, I thank you, father that you and I understand and you and I know. And, and I thank you that you've given to me the ability to reveal to those around me who I would like to reveal this message. That that's the only way they're going to get it is for me to give them a special revelation. Then. Then all of a sudden, the whole conversation shifts and it shifts to us. And Jesus says to us, he says it to me and you today, just like he said it to whoever was listening then, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Have you seen Franklin Graham's new um, commercial I loved Billy Graham. I followed every crusade and listened to messages, and I love the simplicity of Billy Graham's message. Billy Graham was such a stately man. He was a good-looking man, don't you think? The older he got, I felt like the older he got, the better looking he got. And so this week I was watching the TV, and all of a sudden Franklin comes on with this 30-second commercial. Have you seen it? He's such a good-looking man. And I've never thought he was a good-looking man. In his youth, you know, when he was riding his Harley Davidson and going his wild direction, I thought, well, he's nothing like his daddy, but the older he gets. And in this commercial, he looks like his daddy. Gray hair, stately, beautiful suit. And he says to us in this 30-second 30, 30 commercial, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I asked Jesus into my life. And I prayed this prayer. And if you would like to do the same, you can pray this prayer. See, the very same simple message that his dad was so successful with, Franklin is understanding that Jesus will reveal Jesus to whoever he wants to. And our role is to say that we've been sick and tired of being sick and tired without a Savior. So here is the simplicity. Here is the simple Christian message of the heart and soul of who we are. Point number one, Jesus comes to our rescue. We believe it, we embrace it, we accept it, we affirm it. Jesus comes to our rescue for our salvation because of who he is, because of his identity, because Jesus and the Father are one. You know what's so unique about the gospel? There's been a whole lot of debate about this and, and people will want to say, do you think, Pastor, that the early church really understood who Jesus was and that Jesus was God and that Jesus was very, very different than the expectation that the Hebrew people had of who the Messiah was going, going to be? I believe the church did realize it. I believe they realized it from day one. And I believe they began to articulate, even with Peter's very first sermon in the second chapter of Acts, I believe, yes, we knew because of the revelation of Jesus Christ revealed to us as he came to our rescue for our salvation. Now the reason we as modern day scholars might ask ourselves, did the early church know, 
is because it took the church about 300 years before they could put it in proper words for us to understand simply as part of our faith and part of our witness that Jesus was, is, forever will be God. At the Council of Nicaea in 325, we finally penned these words. And I like this, I like this part about my initial point, for our salvation. Uh, look at the words to the Nicaean Creed as they state uh, on this next slide, if you'll bring that up for me, uh, the next slide. There you go. This is what we wrote in 325 A.D. about Jesus. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God, begotten of the Father as only begotten. We don't use that word begotten too much anymore, but what that means is Jesus was not born. And it goes on to explain that is from the essence of, Jesus wasn't born from the Father. Jesus came from the essence of the Father. God from God. Light from light. True God from true God. Begotten, not created. Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem. He came as a human being in Bethlehem, but Jesus was in the beginning. Jesus was part of the creating God. The same essence as the Father through whom all things came into being in creation, both in heaven and in earth, who for us, and here's that phrase, and for our salvation came down to our rescue and was incarnate becoming human. See, I believe we had that revelation from the moment Jesus conquered the grave. From the moment he suffered and died on that cross, the revelation was given to us. And that revelation was so profound because Jesus said, I thank you, Father in heaven, that you're allowing me to reveal myself to those whom I choose. Because those disciples went from sniveling cowards who were hiding in the darkness to men of bold proclamation of faith who were not fearful of anything after the resurrection. Because Jesus had revealed Jesus' self to them. As, he does, as, as Franklin Graham says, if you will just say, if you will just pray this prayer, I believe in you. I accept you. This is my God. This is my Lord. Jesus is quoted by John in his gospel as saying these words, I am the resurrection and I am life. It could not be any clearer. Jesus is our rescue for our salvation. We are saved through our faith, through our profession that Billy Graham was so gifted in sharing and his son Franklin now is doing the same. The second thing that happens right in this moment that makes it all about who we are as Christians this is our moment in Jesus. Jesus offers us. Jesus frees us. Jesus provides for us, my second point, regeneration. Regeneration. He saves us this way. Now, regeneration is a fancy theological word that simply means rebirth. How do we put it in our terms as we share the gospel with those around us? You must be born again. Regeneration means new life, new creation. The old is gone and you have been born anew, regenerated 
Listen again to what Jesus uh, shared in Matthew's gospel to those that he was introducing with his invitation. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Billy Graham and Franklin said, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And what? Jesus says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus isn't talking about a Sunday afternoon nap. When he gives us this image of resting in Jesus, it is this image of being born anew as a new creature that no longer has to be sick and tired of being sick and tired, who no longer has to live life weary and burdened down by the circumstances of life because we are lifted up out of those circumstances by the new birth, by being born again, as we enjoy saying in our modern way, through Jesus' saving grace. We're new. The old is gone. The old is out of the way. And now we have new life. And in that new life, Jesus, Jesus frees us for renewal. Jesus gives us a life of renewal to and through grace. When he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, that's hard to understand, isn't it? Because I don't know about you, I can look around this room. I can look around Lots of Christian people and say, well, that doesn't look very easy what they're going through. Looks like to me, things aren't going their way. We've even had people outside of our faith say, if that's the good news, I don't want any part of it. Because people are equating our mortal life, our mortal existence with our rebirth. And it's not the same thing. And when Jesus talked about new life and new renewal of life, he wasn't talking about the time that you have left this side of heaven. Circumstances are going to happen to us. You know, I don't, I don't know what that man's life was like who, whose life was snuffed out so quickly yesterday at that assassination attempt. But it ended, didn't it? And it ended abruptly and tragically. What if this was a godly man? What if it, we find out that, that he and his family served in such a wonderful way through the Christian faith? It wouldn't surprise me. And yet, boy, where was Jesus? That looks kind of burdensome to me to have everything in so abruptly and so horrifically. I see this side of heaven something that we struggle with when it comes to this notion of uh, his, his yoke. You know, when Jesus was given this um, analogy, this illustration of a yoke, a yoke is a device that in those days, in Jesus' days, they placed on their animals like oxen or donkey or horse or cattle. It was, a, it was a mechanism that was put on their shoulders and their back that human beings would steer and guide those animals in their drudging work of tilling the fields or pulling heavy objects or whatever they needed for them to be doing. And Jesus says, Life with me is like this, and, and the way I steer you, the way I guide you, is easy. 
and my burden is light. It takes some thinking. It takes some revealing through Jesus for, our, for us to come to a clear understanding of, of what it means to be a simply Christian person. But let me share with you how Paul shares these very words of renewal and what grace looks like and what new life and being born again looks like within Jesus' new, new rebirth. In Romans chapter 6, we read from Paul. He starts in verse 5. He says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with Jesus so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Christ. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead. We'll never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you, simply Christian, also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in your birth in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies when you're still this side of heaven to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but listen, but under grace. Grace is amazing. Grace is what changed in all of us when we prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we entered into his rescue, and we now enter into the rebirth with sin no longer having dominion over our life and the renewal in our life that it, now, it's, it's eternal life is now in those of us who are in Christ. Sin is dead to us and no longer has dominion. Now it's an interesting thing what happens between the time you accept Christ and the time you enter into glory, into that state of no longer being mortal. Paul said it this way. Paul said it a lot of ways, but he, he, he made sense when he said to us, Listen, we're in this world, but we're not of it. We're in it, but we're not of it. We have been given this holiness, this state of sanctifying grace that takes us out of being of it. Oh, we're going to struggle. We're going to find ourselves as human beings struggling with our circumstances. We're going to be just like Job. We're going to be just like some of the disciples. We're going to want to argue and fuss and complain. And sometimes we might even find ourselves wondering, what in the world is going on? 
Paul. He said so many incredible things, but he talked about this sanctifying grace, how it is a growing in grace and understanding. It is a movement toward God. It is a movement in in a way in which the closer you get to God, the more you understand God. But when you begin that movement of sanctifying grace, you're way over here. And you don't quite see everything as clear as you need to. But as you move, it becomes a revelation. And the Holy Spirit continues to pull you and reveal to you. You know what's different about us in that sanctifying grace? Is that we begin to see and we begin to hear from the very essence and nature of God living in us. Don't do that. You don't need that anymore. You're not of that anymore. That isn't right. Don't let that worldview, that misinterpretation, enter into the essence of your life as being simply Christian. It's not who you are. And so we become obedient. And we become Slaves to the righteousness of God's love and grace. Paul argued, Paul fussed, he said, God, listen, I'm really, really struggling with this circumstance. If you will just take it away, I know you have the ability to. I can do so much more. And he got a response that is very popular within our view as Christians. My grace. This grace, this grace that comes from renewal is sufficient. You're good. You're good. Jesus. This this is our foundation. Jesus has rescued us. Jesus has given us new life. And Jesus will sustain us us in our eternal relationship with him now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit whom he revealed to us very clearly. Amen. Ethan, would you come sing one more chorus for us as we join our hearts together in our singing and proclamation of who Jesus is and who we are as simply Christ followers. Let's stand as we are led by Ethan and receive our benediction. Jesus, you are all I want to read. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, I found in you. Jesus, you are all I want to read. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, I found in you, found in you, oh, it's found in you, you are all I need, you are all I want, and he is indeed all we need for life in life going forward. Would you receive this benediction today? Go in the love and grace and the rescue that has been provided to you through the amazing love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people say, amen. Have a great week.